Okay, the role of Stafford versus King in Texas land surveying. My name is Tim C. Pappas. I'm a registered professional land surveyor in the state of Texas, and this is for a class in graduate school at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Uh, for those of you who may have accidentally stumbled across this on YouTube, uh, but to Dr. Jeffries and my classmates, this is my presentation to one of the most important court cases um, in Texas boundary law history. To land surveyors in Texas, the court case of Caroline C. Stafford versus Adam C. King, uh, which was filed in Volume 30, Texas Supreme Court, page 257 in 1867, remains one of the most important cases that guide and direct the way boundaries and corners are identified and established. Decided by the Texas Supreme Court during an appeal in April 1867, the case broadly and specifically describes the methods by which surveyors are expected to follow the footsteps of the previous surveyor and his work to locate and define real property boundaries. Some of the key points to be taken from this decision that ultimately became law include, it is the duty of a surveyor of the public land to run around the land located and to see that such objects are designated as will clearly delineate the locality and to call for these objects, natural and artificial, in his field notes of the survey. And when the field notes assert that the survey has been made, the calls will be presumed to be true until the contrary has been proved. As to lost calls, the presumption will be indulged that they have been destroyed or defaced. Even if, be, even if, if it be established that the land was not, in effect, surveyed, the patents will not be held void if the boundaries can be identified by reasonable evidence. The most material and certain calls shall control those which are less material and certain. A call for a natural object, such as a river, a known stream, a spring, or even a marked tree, shall control distance. The course and distance are the most unreliable calls. Distance is less reliable than course because of the mistakes of the officers over which the locator has no control. But of natural and artificial objects, the locator can take note on the ground. The actual identification of the survey and this part is very important, the footsteps of the surveyor on the ground should always be followed by whatever rule they may be traced. In addition, uh, this court case brought up the concept of the dignity of calls, which would be very important, and uh, we'll address that in just a moment. And uh, here we see not only a copy of the original, or I don't know if it's original, very, very old, Texas General Land Office official survey map of Cherokee County in which... Uh, the 640-acre patents in this court case reside. And um, to the right, you see a modern-day surveyor locating, or not only locating, but uh, uncovering the original scribe that was made on a bearing tree or marked tree. Uh, this tree located a property corner that was located in the field notes. So as far as the dignity of calls, um, not only did this court case, through common law, uh, become boundary law, but now, as you can see, it's, uh, it's actually enshrined in the Texas Administrative Code. So this is law that uh, all land surveyors have got to follow uh, when reestablishing old boundary lines. And the hierarchy goes from top, uh, more weight, down to the bottom, less weight. We start off with number one is natural monuments. And a natural monument can be um, a, a creek, a stream, river, a mountain, um, rock, rock outcropping, anything uh, not man-made that can be very clearly identified on the ground either by another land surveyor or a landowner or a layman. And immediately below that, number two, we've got natural, or I'm sorry, artificial monuments, uh, which are things like marked trees, like we saw in the earlier picture, rock mounds, pits, anything that uh, man-made that uh, marks a boundary. Below that, we've got coarse bearing, and, of course, bearing is anything from um, due east to uh, a modern bearing of north, 25 degrees, 15 minutes, 27 seconds west, and below that distance. And the very bottom of the hierarchy, the least weight is given to acreage. So if all monuments are found and all courses and distances and bearings are found to be true and the acreage called for is wrong, well, that's just the way it goes, and the acreage uh, doesn't carry any weight. In fact, the concept 
of following the footsteps of the surveyor. It has been so firmly entrenched into each land surveyor's practice over the years, it's now a matter of indisputable fact. This concept is so important that in Texas, one of the portions of the RPLS exam is a legal thesis where examinees analyzed and studied the court cases that became case law and established the canon of what we call the canon of boundary law that we follow today. Stafford versus King is on that exam and therefore is very important because it outlines and establishes many of the methods, procedures, and rules that we use today. Stafford versus King is still cited by many lawsuits and court cases where there is either a trespass to try title case or to establish the precedent of boundary survey methods. So a little bit of history of the court case. Uh, Cherokee County, Texas, um, actually the patents were originally filed in the Nacogdoches District. Uh, Cherokee County was created from Nacogdoches County back in 1846. An action to trespass to try title. Now in Texas, this is the uh, really the legal proper means by which to resolve title dispute was brought by Adam King, an owner of 640 of acres of land described by meets and bounds by a patent, original patent to Mobley Roan uh, but as it turned out, was not actually surveyed on the ground. The land claimed by Caroline Stafford, it was found, has very nearly identical legal description and was originally patent, patented to Rise and Franklin in 1838 and uh, commences at the same point as the King survey, but a different distance. So the, the, the conflict appeared to be that King and Stafford were trying to claim the exact same piece of land, uh, but because of an accident, carelessness or inattention by the surveyor and because the marks artificial and natural were not found on the ground where the alleged line lies title to the land was in dispute in addition since the land had been patented and by patented we mean here land severed from the sovereign owner uh, in this case the sovereign owner was the republic of texas in 1838 and conveyed several times by the time stafford and king wound up in court the case also took on a statute of limitation color. So it was determined that the patent to Stafford was correct by virtue of a subsequent survey having found in the field the marked lines and trees that were, carved, were, were called for in her legal description, but the description of the Roan patent that eventually came to be King's Land was never surveyed. The courses and distances in the description not actually matching anything on the ground. The error was found to be in the distance from the commencing point of the survey to the point of beginning of the description of King's land. Once this error was accounted for, the lands of each of the parties would be adjacent to each other. The judge ruled that when there is a question whether the patent alone is sufficient to describe and convey the land that has not been surveyed, then the patent is prima facie, which is Latin for at first sight without further examination, evidence that it is valid. However, the judge noted further that the patent must have been prepared according to the law. The fact that the patent had conflicting distances and placed it within another patented property did not make the patent void. The aforementioned principle of natural and artificial monuments controlling course and distance got its start here. Because the locations of the marked lines and trees were found to be in conflict with the bearings and distances needed to reach those lines and trees, the judge found that the locations of the objects would control. Also, there has been a presumption over the years that because of the limitations of the surveying technology of the day and the limited training and education practitioners, the chance of error in course, <coughs> excuse me, distance was far greater than would be found today with our, uh, with our GPS and with our um, electronic distance measuring. It's also that if all the other all other factors in the legal description were equal, courses and distances would rank much lower than the other items in the so-called priority of calls. So the judge ruled um, that it was the duty of the surveyor to run around the land located and intended to be embraced by the survey and patent and to see that such objects are designated on it as will clearly point out and identify the locality and the boundaries of the property. The description of the objects, such as the natural and artificial monuments, are clearly defined and described in the field notes and accompanying map or plat. Other rulings in this case make the point that if no monuments are defined or stated, course and distance is sufficient for the land to be laid out. 
And what that means is um, if we happen to run across a so-called paper survey or an office survey or protraction survey where the survey was next, never actually out on the ground, but um, it's commenced at a, a known location that could be found and ran distances and bearings around without making any reference to found or set monuments, that that was still a legal description and a, still a, a, a valid patent, but um, it just it, it, it could not make any reference to any monuments unless those were actually located on the ground. Okay, and what we see here is an excerpt of uh, the original Texas General Land Office survey map of Cherokee County. And in red, I've highlighted the Franklin Rising 640 acre patent. And you can see in the context of how it fit together with all of the adjacent surveys. Well, in theory, it should have fit together, but in practice, there was always a few uh, overlaps or, or missing calls or what have you. And I've labeled the point of commencement. And you see the point of commencement is at the southeast corner of the John R. Taylor survey. And because the John R. Taylor survey was senior, it was already on the ground. Location of that corner was, uh, was well known. And so all the surveyor had to do is find that location, that monument, whatever it happened to be, and uh, go a certain distance to the point of beginning. This slide, you can see the, um, the modern day context and, context and location of the Rise and Franklin survey, the same exact 640 acres of land in red there, uh, but with um, a modern day map. Underlaying that is a uh, US Geological Survey topographic map that shows uh, today's infrastructure. You can see two highways running across the property. And importantly, it also shows the creeks, the modern day location of the same creeks that were located by the original surveyor back in 1838. And even though this map uh, does not have those creeks labeled, uh, mud and camp creeks were located in the original field notes or where he crossed them at uh, so many varics. And a varic uh, was, uh, was a distance of measurement equal to 33 and one third inches. So the original field notes mention camp and mud creeks and you can see up on the northerly property line uh, the two creeks in more or less the, the same location as they were back then. And this is telling because this is a uh, context in how we can find an original land survey and compare it to what was done back in 1838. This slide here uh, is an excerpt from a working sketch that was created by a surveyor or a technician in the Texas General Land Office. Uh, this is a fairly recent thing uh, done a few years ago. And you can see where every descriptive call of every field note of every survey in the area has been placed together uh, as a comparison. And you can see immediately where uh, as a graphic representation of where each and every marked line, marked tree, corner, uh, creek crossing, and uh, all, the, all the particular patent information has been listed. So not only can you compare uh, the Rise and Franklin survey against his adjoiners, but you can see how his adjoiners all fit together. And again, this is all in theory. Uh, they should fit together perfectly. Uh, but because of all kinds of um, technological issues over the years, some things don't always fit together properly. But this is a good, very good idea or a good way of seeing how everything is supposed to fit together. This slide here uh, is a copy of the original field notes that were done by the original surveyor in 1838. And it's a little hard to see uh, but if you can read it, you can see immediately uh, and, and very specifically what the surveyor did. He commenced at the southeast corner of the John R. Uh, Taylor survey, and he went east 750 varas to the point of beginning. From the point of beginning, he went north so many varas to a marked tree, uh, thence east so many varas, crossing creeks at so many varas, crossing another creek at so many varas to the northeast corner and so on and so forth until he went clockwise around the entire property closing back in at the point of beginning. And this is of course is important because uh, we're using these descriptive calls, uh, the natural and artificial monuments called for, uh, creeks, the marked trees, whatever he happened to set. And as we saw back there in the working sketch, we can place his description on the ground in the context of his adjoiners very clearly. So that's what I've got for you. This is the role of Stafford versus King in Texas land survey.